Let me say that again. True worship cannot happen except there is rebirth, except there is regeneration. That's how we are in spirit, metamorphosized in spirit and in truth. It's in us. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Because that was all of my introduction. That was all my introduction. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse number one, it says, Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. This is huge. We talked about parables not being just earthly stories with heavenly meanings. But we said the parables were window, clear windows for us to look through, to see the inner workings of the kingdom of God, the inner workings of the kingdom of God and the nature of God and the character of God as father. We never knew about his character. We never knew about his nature. We never knew about the, the, the makeup of the kingdom, but for parables, Jesus as the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth, he manifests in the earth, Yahshua Amashiach, to bring us into sonship, but also to bring us into the knowledge, the inner knowledge and the inner working of the kingdom of God, the knowledge of the inner workings of the kingdom of God. Jesus does it through parables. The disciples asked him at one point, they said, why do you speak in parables? He says, because it's not given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom. He says, but to you it's given, but not to them. But I don't want you to minimize what I'm doing. These parables are much more than just stories. They're windows, they're clear windows for us to look through, to see, to have access to what was once veiled. Remember on Mount Sinai, we couldn't even come close. Moses went up to the mountain. All we heard were thunder, thunderings and all we saw were lightnings and, the, and smoke and fire. And we had to stand, the people had to stand afar off. But now we're brought nigh, we're brought nigh, we're brought near and parables bring us near. They're akin to going up to the mountain and having access to what only a select few had access to. So when the scripture says, and he opened his mouth and taught and spoke in parables and said, take notice because he's bringing us into revelation, into dimensions that we never knew before. We never knew this about God as father. We never knew that the father had two sons in Luke 15. We never knew that the father had two sons. All we, all we saw was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his descendants. That's all we saw. All we saw were the 12 tribes of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, uh, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. We saw the 12 tribes and we saw God dealing with Israel. We saw God dealing with Judah. We saw God dealing with the Jews. But we never knew that the whole time a certain man had two sons. I want you to write that down. The whole time. Oh, Luke 15 was the first time we heard it. Luke 15 was the first time we were informed. We never knew that. A certain man had two sons. We never knew that. That Abraham's descendants naturally were bringing us into spiritual descendants. One family bringing us into an, a heavenly family. Jews and Gentiles. We never knew that. That the prodigal that left represented the Gentiles and the son that stayed represented the Jews. We never knew that. I must have heard the story of the prodigal son preached at least a thousand times in my lifetime. And not one time did I hear it on the level of and in the context of the prodigal represented the Gentiles. Oh, if only we as pastors would get to the true context. Jesus was speaking of a certain man had two sons. He's speaking of Jews and Gentiles. Stay with me. And so the marriage feast, here we go again in Matthew 22, the same spirit of the kingdom. The spirit of the kingdom is feasting, not just fasting. Let me say that again. The spirit of the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom is not just fasting, but is also feasting. Remember, there was a time when they argued with Jesus. They said, your disciples don't fast. John's disciples fast. The Pharisees fast. Everyone else is fasting except your disciples. They were offended and they were, they were trying to understand this. How come your disciples are not fasting? Jesus said unto them, he says, then I'm paraphrasing. You can write, you can, you can read this in your private time. Jesus says, you know, these are the children of the bridegroom or the bridal party. They, they, the, those who have the, the, the bride, it's the bridegroom. Should they fast when the bridegroom is here? 
No, when the bridegroom is here, it's time to feast. That's a revelation. Where he was, was fasting. And where he now is, is feasting. He said, but when the bridegroom leaves, then they're going to fast in those days. But I want you to understand that the kingdom is not just about fasting. I know all we hear is fasting and praying, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is we're imbalanced. Because if we spend all of our time fasting for what God, we want God to do, when are we going to feast for what we believe God has already done? That there is a realm of the already done. We didn't know that. There is, God, a dimension of the already done. We fast for what we believe God is going to do. We feast because our faith now knows God has already done it. And we are now seated with him in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. We have the bridegroom. We never knew that before. This is going to be the first of the year. And all you're going to hear about Daniel's fast. Do you understand Daniel would have loved to see the day that we're in now? Daniel did not have access to what we have access to now. You are all going to where he was. But that's a whole nother message for another time. The kingdom has a culture of feasting and we knew it, never knew that before. I don't discourage fasting at all. But I want the body of Christ to open themselves as new wineskins for the new wine to a whole nother dimension. Is the bridegroom with you? It's time to celebrate. It's time to feast. He says that there's marriage. There's a marriage feast. There's a marriage feast made a marriage or a marital feast for the son. You see that in verse number two. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Look at verse four. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto, you see that the marriage. Everything is ready. You're invited. Come to the feast, come to the wedding feast. I told you that the, the kingdom is about feasting. The centerpiece of the kingdom is feasting. But he says this, that he is speaking of the Jews. He says they would not come. Those who were bidden are the Jews. I want you to write that down. And you can see why this was controversial. You can see why what Jesus said was offensive and why they wanted to kill him. And they tried to kill him after this conversation because Jesus's words were very poignant and very uh, clear. He says, I sent forth my servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things they are ready come unto the marriage. I want you to see the fatlings and the oxen that are killed as the com completed work on Calvary. When Jesus says it is finished, that's really what this is. Verse four is a prophetic uh, uh, revelation concerning what we saw in on Calvary, what Jesus is going to later on do on Calvary is revealed in verse four, fatlings and oxen. They are killed. The dinner, the centerpiece, the feasting, the dinner is prepared. Fatlings are killed and all things are ready. How many understand that Christ's death on the cross made all things ready? I want you to write that down. His sacrificial death on the cross. He as a propitiation who justifies us by faith in him makes all things ready, makes all things ready, makes all things new. When he said it is finished, it is akin to oxen and fatlings are killed. Everything is already prepared. It is finished, said everything is prepared. Walk in the finished work. God, you all walk in the finished work. I don't have to do anything else. Why? The oxen and the fatlings are killed. No more preparation is needed. No more cooking is needed. But why? Because it is finished. Let's move on. It, it says on all things are ready. All you have to do is come. Come to the marriage feast. Look at verse number five. He says, but they made light of it and went their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. He's speaking of what is going to happen. What has happened, but what shall happen with the apostles and the prophets and the many who will be martyred. Because this, this gospel message of salvation that the Messiah had come already in the form of Yahshua Amashek, that he was born in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. He was born of a Virgin Mary, that this message was treated with apathy, indifference and scorn. 
And as a matter of fact, the messengers were killed. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is how they were treated. And look at verse number seven. But when the king heard thereof, he was very angry and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city judgment because of the rejection, the rejection of this awesome invitation. In verse eight, then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which are bidden were not worthy. I want you to see this. Verse nine, go ye therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. Highlight verse number nine. Go ye therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find invite <laughs> to the marriage. I asked you a couple of weeks ago to, to go to the book of Jonah. I said, read Jonah chapters one through chapter four. People of God, that's verse number nine, the book of Jonah. God telling Jonah, get up. I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to cry against that city. The Ninevites, the Gentiles, an Old Testament story turns out has New Testament implications. This was all prophetic. This was all pointing to the ones who were invited, they would not come. But I want you to go to the highways. Jonah, go to Nineveh. <laughs> and because he's, it's, he has an old wineskin mentality, what God says is offensive to him. It's unbelievable. It is insulting. So what does Jonah do? He gets on a ship and goes the opposite direction. Because the Jews have no dealings with the Ninevites. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You heard the disciples to, the, to that Syrophoenician woman, to that Greek woman. Send her away. She crieth after us. You heard what the woman of Samaria say. Uh, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. It's the same, con it's the same paradigm. The pendulum is swinging now. There's a shifting, it's, and it's seismic. I told you that weeks ago. This was seismic. This was underneath the, the, the surface. This was the tectonic place said that there was a shifting. You all, we throw the word shifting around. When God shifts, it's not shallow. It's not superfluous. It's, it's not that shifting to God is seismic. Jonah being told to go to Nineveh, it was a shifting. It was seismic. And guess what? Jonah discovered when he finally, after being uh, regurgitated and vomited on dry ground from the fish, and he preaches, there is repentance. The Ninevites repented. The Gentiles repented. And there was great revival. Jonah was so upset that he wanted God to take his life. He was so down, depressed, despondent because God, he even tells God, I knew you would have mercy. I knew you would have mercy on them. I didn't want this. He saw this. He didn't like it. He was repulsed by it. He didn't want it. Old wineskin. Judaism. The law. The Jews. My upbringing. My tradition. My custom. It's us. It's just we're, we're the descendants of Abraham. This, this is our inheritance. This is the children's bread. It's not meat to take the children's bread and to give it to the dogs. These are the Gentiles. Jonah was shocked. What preacher would be mad when God calls the sinner to repentance and the altar is filled? Who gets upset? Jonah did. I tell you who. The legalists do. The self-righteous do. Those who believe that they have uh, cornered the market and they have ownership of this. God says, how dare you? And I'm paraphrasing. These people don't know the difference between their left hand and their right. No wonder Jesus comes back and says, a greater than Jonah is here. You know what makes Jesus greater than Jonah is that he was excited about the reformation and the revival and the change that was taking place. We must needs go through Samaria. Woman, believe me, the hour coming. That sounds to me like a greater than Jonah was here. The true worshiper shall worship the father in spirit and in truth. Why? Because a greater than Jonah is here. I'm not going to be upset. I may have been ambivalent, but I won't be upset because salvation, though, is of the Jews. It's not to the Jews only. 
the true worshipers. A certain man.